Well, everybody, this is it. Uh, we are come to the, the sermon time today. We're continuing in our series called Honest Advent, and that this series really is, uh, like it says up on the screen, we're, we're trying to come to the season of Advent with fresh eyes to contemplate the vulnerability of the incarnation where, uh, you know, the Word of God made flesh, what that must have been like. And all of that really waking us up to the wonder that God is here with us, even now. And so through that, um, last week, you can go to the next slide. Last week, we will do a little review. We learned that we connect with Jesus through vulnerability. That, that's not always a fun thing to think about, but where, you know, our human connection, our connection with people and things, it requires a sense of openness and a sense of vulnerability there. And so, uh, you know, there we, we covered the idea of, you know, vulnerability through anticipation and through patience and ultimately the revealing or revelation of that connection, Jesus. And so through this Advent season, we talked about how we can connect with Jesus through things like remembering him, through reflection, and ultimately, like we're doing this morning, worship. And that brings us to today. The topic and title for today's message is love. Uh, we're going out of the traditional order a little bit, but we're talking about love today. Our main passage today is Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 3, and the big idea that we're going to be exploring is to be known is to risk being loved or not. To be known is to risk being loved or not. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so growing up, there were a number of traditions that my parents passed along to me that I experienced. I'm sure you had a similar dynamic as well. Um, one of them was this issue of wrapping presents. Um, and when I was younger, it was like I was just this wide-eyed uh, kid thinking, wow, so great, this is amazing, wow, so good. But what was unique is my parents... Uh, one of the things that they chose to do, uh, because it's the holidays and it's fun, uh, is to um, practice the art of deception with gift wrapping. Have, have you ever done this before? So like, there's, there's the spectrum. So on one end, there is no imagination whatsoever. You just wrap the thing, and it could be a bike, and it's wrapped in the shape of a bike. Or it may not even be wrapped. It might just have a bow on there, but it's just literally right there. Or there's the other end of the spectrum where you are trying to dupe them and trying to make them think, I might be getting more than, than I think I am. And so my parents would do this thing where, you know, they would, if it was a small item, they would put it in a large box, right? But not only that, I'm sure you've done a similar thing where it's like, but that's not so deceptive because all I got to do is pick up the box and if it's light, it's a light thing. So they would sometimes put bricks in there or like, or rocks or things, right? And all of that is, you know, in an effort to try to, you know, entice the child, myself included, you know, to think, wow, this is going to be so amazing, so great, you know? Um, but maybe it's just a sweater <laughs> or a pair of socks or something. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with those kinds of gifts. It's just, if I think I'm getting something this big and it's just a pair of socks, there's, there's a bit of a letdown, isn't there? Now we all, I, you know, you're all chuckling a little bit, so I'm sure you've all practiced this in one way or another. Um, you know, we also, in wrapping presents, we try to excite the thing, the, the event of unwrapping the gift by having really exciting wrapping, right? Uh, you know, you, and it used to cost an arm and a leg, but now you can just get it at Dollar Tree. Um, and, uh, but 
I, I remember how when I was in college, I had, you know, almost this reverse reaction where I was like, I'm going to just plain Jane this. I'm going to put it in, uh, you know, uh, oh, what is it? Like a grocery sack. I would like cut up a grocery sack and I'd just wrap it up. And in all of this, I'm not making any kind of a statement on those kinds of practices. That's all good. Um, I, I've practiced all of them, and I will continue to do so as time progresses. But what I'd like to suggest to you is sometimes we try just naturally to make things seem better than they really are, where maybe we try to you know, excite the process of things by making it look better by, by wrapping it up in a pretty package or something. But sometimes the real reality of it isn't as, as good um, as, it, as it could be. Or it could be amazing, one or the other. But with this practice of wrapping presents, we all, you know, so there's that action, but then there's also the actions that we do in life. Um, you know, I learned in school, dress for success, right? And so uh, the idea of putting on a nice shirt and a nice tie and like, you know, putting your best foot forward, there's nothing wrong with that. But in our natural state, what do we look like? And so, <laughs> my bad. Anyway, I love you all and you love me and that's what's important here. So we're talking about love today though. And we're talking specifically about a passage where it's really, it's, it's an ironic passage to me because of how we, you know, so it's a foretelling passage. You can go to the next slide. It's a foretelling passage where, you know, uh, God is, again, telling of a day when he's going to set everything right, when he's going to send his servant, his chosen servant, the Messiah to go and save his people Israel and ultimately the world. And there's lots of imagery, lots of good. If you're ever interested, read the book of Isaiah. It's a trip. It's really awesome. But we're telling of like this, this foretelling sort of thing. And when we think of, you know, the promised savior of the world and we think about, you know, someone that maybe we would be excited about following or being rescued by, you know, uh, would you rather be rescued by a construction worker or Tom Cruise? I don't know. Uh, maybe you don't like Tom Cruise. That's okay. That, that fell flat anyway. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's this dynamic. And so we're going to read a passage that it's a foretelling passage about this promised Messiah. And so in the book of Isaiah, one of the great things, it, it's a prophecy book, so it's telling the future. But we're in the section where he's gone through a couple of different kings. He's been an advisor to some kings. Uh, this is winding down towards the end of the nation of Judah, where they're about to go into exile uh, within the next 10 years or so. And so in 689 BC, you know, this is almost 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. But um, God is telling of a day when he's going to send his servant and when his, this Messiah, this Savior would be revealed. And so that's the context for our passage, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, if you'd like to follow along on the screen, you're welcome to do that as well. Isaiah 53, talking about God's servant. So, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant... And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, 
a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This is the picture, this is the revelation of this Messiah. But it's a little unexpected, isn't it? Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so we're talking about incarnation, God taking on uh, human flesh. And so when, you know, God became human and, you know, incarnation, it's the process of becoming seen. Um, for God, you know, it, it, uh, in verse 1, it says, you know, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That word arm it literally means arm, but, you know, figuratively, there's some connotation with that word. So it can mean protection, you know, strength, uh, the strength of the Lord. It can mean provision, where, you know, you're working the, you know, working with your hands, you're providing. Um, and uh, within the context of the book of Isaiah, it can also be a reference to, um, you know, the comfort of a shepherd. We sang earlier uh, in one of the songs earlier, you know, the image of uh, God as a shepherd and that his, there's that famous Psalm, Psalm 23, that, you know, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's a comfort to, you know, God's strength. There's also the inverse of it where you don't want to be on the other end <laughs> of that discipline. But so, to whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? And we're about to see how that all works. But this process of becoming seen, God chose in his love to be seen by us, to become vulnerable, to give himself freely to us without reserve. The truth is that love, unconditional love, but then also love as a person, as God, love is freely given. He gives of himself freely without condition. All he asks is that you receive him. But in that receiving, there's that, that sight piece, which we'll get to. You can go to the next slide. So now, to be seen, though, so incarnation is the process of being seen. To be seen is to allow yourself to be known, to open up, and to, you know, see the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, uh, whether that's, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, you know. Um, to be seen truly as you are is, you know, to allow yourself to be known, to be an open book. And for God, he chose to do that. So in verse 2, it says, you know, he grew up like uh, a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. That's good because, you know, new life out of dead places, barren land, new life, you know, this young plant, it's good. But then it says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And this is where it gets ironic for me, because in thinking about my Savior, the one who loves me, the one who cares for me, the one who's there with me through it all, I, I picture him as beautiful. And yet, what's being told in Isaiah would suggest Jesus may not have been such a looker. <laughs> um, he, you know, he wouldn't have been very enticing as a person. He may, you know, there's lots of characters in the Bible where they make a remark saying like he was so handsome and like his long flowing hair or whatever. But but this Messiah wasn't going to be that. He wasn't going to be all wrapped up in, you know, this enticing sort of package to make us think, oh, he's so great. 
Maybe I should be saved by him. Instead, he chose to just be himself. Oh, I'm about to knock off my coffee there. Um, he chose to be himself, he, to be known by us, to be open and vulnerable to us. You can go to the next slide. And so then, to be known is to risk being loved or not. So then there's that, that third verse there. So things are not looking good so far. And it says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Did you know the word despised happened twice there? That's not good news, folks. I mean, where this is, he, you know, the Messiah, he is risking being loved. He's putting himself out there. He's saying, here I am. I may not be very pretty, but here I am. I'm here to save you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to, you know, be the lover of your soul. I'm here to be loved to you. And yet the reaction that's recorded in scripture, and it even happens, you know, later on in the gospels, it suggests that he put himself out there and then we said, no thanks. I'd rather not. I'm going to go over here and do this other thing. Um, maybe this is a more enticing religion or, you know, or worldview or fill in the blank. You know, this, this kind of love, I'm not so sure about. And so, you know, that risk of being loved or not, God put himself out there to be known. And so, uh, you know, as a summary, uh, with these three statements so far, you can go to the next slide. It's a quote from the Honest Advent devotional book, um, which corresponds with this, this, uh, this passage of Scripture. Uh, Scott Erickson, the author, he, he wrote, Incarnation is the process of becoming seen. To be seen is to allow yourself to be known. To be known is to risk being loved or not. So what can we learn from that for us this Advent season or just in life in general? I think the truth is that most of us, if we're being honest, we don't want to be seen. We'd rather hide and not, not be open. Because like we talked about last week, when when you are seen for who you are and how you are and all of that, that means that you are opening yourself up to that rejection or reception. And ideally, with this, this idea of love and being loved, love is it's something that you receive. It's not something you can earn. It's something that you receive. But that takes a vulnerability, that takes an openness. And, you know, to be seen is to allow yourself to be known. That's scary because sometimes we don't want people to know, you know, the deep, dark depths, maybe not even dark, but just the deep depths of our soul. You know, I think about how, oh man, my daughter Maggie this morning, she wears her heart on her sleeve. <laughs> There's no, no getting around it. But man, like just some of the deep emotion that she has, thankfully she feels safe enough around me to share those emotions. But that takes an openness and not everybody wants to do it. And I don't blame you. I don't want to do it either. Because to really be known that means that you can either accept me or reject me. And that's not a fun place to be. But the payoff is, that, that's a terrible phrase, but you know, the benefit, the good, the gift is that to be known, it's a risk. But ultimately the outcome 
is the possibility, it's the breeding ground for love to take place. And so, this Advent season, there's plenty of opportunities to connect with loved ones, whether via telephone or in-person gatherings uh, or events and things that are happening throughout town or in your life, like we talked about earlier. You know, some of us, we have plans to go and see family at this certain date and this certain time on this, this thing. I would encourage you that this Advent, maybe try being like Jesus and opening up yourself to other people, even when it's scary, even when, you know, maybe there's some issues of non-reconciliation happening, like there's irreconcilable things happening. The encouragement that I would have for you is to try, for the sake of love, opening yourself up to be seen, to be known. And that is going to be a risk, and that's going to feel vulnerable and, and scary and like, oh, goodness, now I'm exposed and like, now I can be hurt. But at the same time, there's that possibility of finding healing and finding the good that's possible because of God's love. And in the event, I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you, in the event that you face rejection and even despisement, if that's even a word, <laughs> being despised, you are in good company because our Lord did that for you and for me. And so I just want to encourage you that our God loves you so much and he loves me so much that he went through this kind of humbling ridicule just for the possibility of being loved by us. And that's good news because he's worth it. He may not be a looker, but he's worth it.